Hi, my name's Chris Berg. I'm from the RMIT Blockchain Innovation Hub at RMIT University in Melbourne. I'm a crypto economist and I'm really excited to be joined by, in fact, my colleague, uh, Professor Jason Potts um, from the RMIT Blockchain Innovation Hub. Hi, Jason. Good morning, Chris. It's good to be here. Um, and I'm also excited to welcome to this conversation about treasury management, um, Scott Moore from Gitcoin. Hi, Scott. Hey, all. Good to be here. I'd like to actually just ask a little bit about um, each of your backgrounds um, so that we've got some context and so that the viewers have some idea about um, where you're coming from and how you've approached the questions of treasury management. I'll, I'll throw to you first, Scott. So um, you're, you're, you're deeply involved in the Gitcoin project, of course. How does Gitcoin and your background in Gitcoin help you think about sort of treasury management and, and how we spend the funds that we have in um, these enormous blockchain treasuries? So I think with Gitcoin, the particular thing to note is, you know, our mission has always been to grow and sustain uh, digital public goods across Web3. And so, you know, in terms of our treasury, we actually take a particularly uh, broad view of what counts as relevant for spending. And, and that includes things that might not be traditionally thought of as part of the Gitcoin ecosystem. Um, that includes things like matching pools for uh, you know, various sorts of quadratic funding. It includes things like partnerships with projects like Versus, which are aimed at trying to sort of help, help Web3 articulate its values. And more generally, I think, you know, we're one of the larger DAOs um, in terms of total treasury. And so although we have to be prudent, um, I think that gives us sort of an impetus to be experimental, to try things, to work with the community and actively try to uh, find ways to make it useful in the world. I think um, those are at least the two first things that come to mind. But um, yeah, for me, uh, you know, treasury management is, uh, is almost less about management and more about mission. It's more about how do we actually achieve the things that we want to uh, want to see in the world. So Jason, um, when you think about, I, I really like that idea, it's not about management, it's about mission. So why don't I step back and then just ask you from an economic perspective, what is the purpose of the treasury itself? Yeah, so tre treasury is a is obviously a public good. It's, it's a, or a local public good, or um, as economists sometimes say, a club good. So a group of people come together and they need to create a collectively shared resource um, that benefits them all. And the treasury is a solution to that problem of, of, of how you have collective ownership of something that everyone will benefit from. Um, now, by definition, that's going to require um, agreement and coordination, which means governance. And that, that sort of solution to this problem of um, creating a collective resource that benefits the members of a community, that enables the community to hold each other accountable for um, contributions to it, to, to monitoring, to, to the maintenance of it, and crucially to the development of that, of that collective resource. Now, um, you know, a, a treasury is a sort of corporate version of, of that same object, but we, you know, we also have other solutions to it. We have, you know, governments have national treasuries um, where, you know, all the citizens of a nation collectively contribute taxes into a common pool. Then we make collective decisions about that. That's called politics, that, there's, that, that sort of political... Um, um, political decision making requires administration. That's the civil service or you know, various agencies and so on that, that build those um, often infrastructures or, or collective sort of actions. So you know, there's there's a lot of um, you know we live in a world where we have lots of big solutions to that big problem. What we don't have is um, well developed solutions to this new problem of what does this look like in a digital world. And what does this look like when we're not all um, from the same country? Or well, what if we look like when we haven't met each other? We, we, don't, we lack these other sort of governance institutions that would normally be used to control us, such as voting or identity registries or other sort of systems. So there's this, you know, I mean, my area is, I'm an innovation economist. I specialize in the economics of new technologies and, and so on. And But I also do a lot of work on institutional and public economics, which is really the, how do you solve these public goods problems? And what's absolutely fascinating about um, you know, DAO and treasury management is this, this intersection of this new, a new technological world that requires a new solution to an old problem. And so what we're seeing is just this explosion of, um, on the one hand, experimentation, you know, this is a blank canvas in a sense. We can we can program it. We can try new things, but in the in the other sense, we're doing this as you know, 
evolved cultural beings that have been living this for, you know, individually tens of years, collectively for tens of thousands of years, trying to solve this same hard problem of how do we cooperate to create shared public resources that work, that are the ones we want to build, um, that function for the community, and crucially, that solve the sort of commons problem, that, that the people that benefit contribute. And that we don't that we minimize the amount of free riding um, in that sense. And the reason we care about that is that you know these things are, are fragile resources; they can collapse if they're not contributed to, um, and they can be captured. People can build the wrong stuff if we have um, you know particularly powerful individuals within a collective taking over the allocation of the treasury. They'll build things that benefit them, not the group. So you know, lots of hard social problems to be solved in this new technological realm. So Scott, Jason has described the decision making behind how to spend a treasury as a collective decision making problem. We need to come together as a community and figure out how to spend, you know, what what is real money. Um, when you're thinking about it from from both the macro perspective, for, from the you know the, the the cryptocurrency space, but also from Gitcoin's perspective, how do you how do you, what do you think about first? How are we going to come to these collective decisions? So ultimately, in my view, the treasury management problem in this case is best solved by, you know, the same sort of, um, you know, governance that we actually have a lot of trouble with in the context of the real world, which is uh, sort of representative democracy, um, i.e. you have a set of delegates or stewards who uh, are able to receive voting power and then make decisions that represent the broader group according to the will of the people. Um, in the context of the uni slash comp like um, governor models that we use, or even in the context of some of the open Zeppelin models, um, a lot of that takes place in a sort of liquid democratic fashion, i.e. you can at any time decide to delegate to yourself or to swap your delegates. Um, that process to me gives a lot more flexibility than in the traditional sort of political systems we often think about, in which you kind of have one say over the decision making of the entire you know country in a four-year period or depending on the country just over a relatively long amount of time um so that's one piece is just having some form of checks and balances by which you can ensure that representatives are paying attention to what's happening in governance um, and then making decisions accordingly and that people can swap their representation accordingly but the other part i think is figuring out ways to signal preferences and that's what quadratic funding is kind of all about. So the way that quadratic funding works is you just take effectively um, the number of people that are supporting a given set of projects. Um, you basically distribute funds proportional to the amount of uh, sort of not funds, but rather, uh, you know, kind of not the number of contributions that a project gets. So you can imagine project A gets, say, uh, two $4 uh, donations, project B gets eight uh, $1 donations. Uh, the former would get a matching amount uh, just naively of uh, $16. The latter would get a matching amount of $64. Um, and you would effectively just normalize those matching amounts by the matching pool itself. So project A would get 20% uh, and project B would get 80%. And the reason that's useful is because we've learned something in the process of people donating to these projects about their actual like preferences. And they've done so. They've done the signaling in such a way that they have skin in the game so that they actually can be sure that you know this is a preference that they care strongly about um, relative to any any other options and so that's being useful for us to you know deploy um, as a signaling or sort of voting mechanism around funding in the ethereum ecosystem something that we're using for gitcoin uh, itself um, at a very small scale right now just as we test it in this sort of like construction of new work streams um, but uh, that's that's sort of like the layer on top of the broader representative democratic uh, model. It's interesting though, Jason, sort of stepping back and thinking through how Gitcoin's doing it. In fact, how most DAOs are doing it. They're doing, um, uh, they're spending their treasury, or at least a big part of their treasury through a grants program. So um, people apply to a grants program that might have a cer certain set of rules and it will have a decision-making structure, which Scott has described in the Gitcoin context as the quadratic funding model. Um, uh, and then, and and then of course they'll receive that. But, but there's lots of different ways that we could spend our treasury and there's lots of different um uh, justifications for why we would choose 
different ways. Now, Jason, you as a professional life term, lifelong academic have received grants before. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you think about where grants as a model for spending a treasury fit into the wider ecosystem of how we would spend money and identify ways to spend money as well? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Look, it's a, it's a big, deep question. And I, I want to dig into the to, um, the, the logic of what should grants be spent upon and how should we spend them and how big should they be. But there's a there's actually a broader point here that I think is worth addressing before we get to that. And that's the sort of what are treasuries actually for question. And so far, we've been treating them um, in the, the the standard way that everyone thinks of them. They're, they're local public goods. They're collective resources. The purpose of them is, is to build infrastructure that everyone can use, right? Now, if that's the case, um, and, and, and especially if you're using them for research, if you wanted to create knowledge that will benefit the community in the future, you want to do that now. You, you want to bring forward as much of the spending as possible for the treasury um, and, and, and put it to use to create immediate value that will benefit the, the future. Um, that's the standard model, and, and, and that's in many ways that is fundamental and true. But there's another model, another way of thinking about treasuries that I think is just interesting to contrast with this. Um, and that's the to emphasize that one of the fundamental differences between a, you know, a, a treasury that's servicing a, a, a digital economy, a blockchain, a, a DAO, is that exit costs are relatively low. I can, um, if, I, if I don't like what's going on, I can just leave, I can fork. Um, that's not generally true in the in the meat space world. Um, it's, I live in Australia. Um, technically, it's illegal for me to leave Australia right now because of COVID laws. Um, um, I mean, just but even if it wasn't, there are high costs of of, of exiting the nation I'm in. I've you know I've, I've I've got a lot of committed resources here. It's hard for me to do that. So that barrier to exit means that. Um, it's actually a lot easier to provide public goods because you can kind of force me to provide them. I, you know, if, if um, I'm, I'm trapped here in a sense. Um, the problem when exit costs are very low is that it's actually very difficult to build public goods because the minute I meet, the minute I feel any um, costs incurring to me about the provision of them, I'm like, okay, see, ya, I'm I'm gone. Now, you know, so e either you solve that problem with culture, you just build a really strong culture and we are here together and this is our project for us to build the thing and you use social, cultural, identity-based reinforcement mechanisms, you know, and in, 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 a, in a strong culture that will work. Um, but it's also exploitable. I, the, the problem with, with, with raising, with creating public goods in that context is that just, um, you know, exit is easy. So another way to think about a treasury is a treasury is a way to raise the exit costs for a community in a world where exit is cheap. Um, because what I'm doing, if I leave, I mean, if, if I don't like what's going on here, if I feel a little bit of imposition, I'll leave, except if there's a huge treasury there that I'm not going to get to share in and the benefits from that if I leave. So what that sort of interestingly and from a game theoretic perspective, um, curiously, creates is that on the one hand, if we're trying to create high quality public goods that benefit us all, spend the treasury as quickly as possible. Unless we're worried about exit, in which case, build the treasury up as huge as you can make it and never spend it. And, you know, solve for the equilibrium, right? So you've got these sort of two, um, these two situations, both of which are true. We want to spend the collective resources now because we benefit all the members of the community in the future, but we also want to maintain the community. And the the the, the where this actually gets, I mean, that's that's not the hard bit. Where it gets hard is that the reason you want to raise the costs of exit is if if the costs of exit are high, and I look at you and I know the costs of exit are also high for you. It's safe for us to invest in idiosyncratic resources. I can I can build some specializations, some you know some some skills or some capital that are specific to this community, and you can build some complementary ones. And I know we can't exploit each other because of that. So it becomes it becomes safe to contribute to a community where you're contributing very specific resources, especially your own skills and your own development um, that have no value outside the community or have less value outside of that. So. That's the reason this is a hard problem. So, you know, the ideal solution is you want a huge treasury, you want to spend it on targeted knowledge resources, or you know, R and D, and you know, giving grants to good people to do good things. 
but you also want it to be big enough and visible enough such that everyone realizes this is a good thing. We want to stick around here and, and, and have that resource last for infinity and, and be part of that. And that's why treasury management is hard. Um, I will actually come back to you in a moment, just Jason, on on the types of grant programs. But Scott, I'll I'll ask you first. So, if we were running a DAO just as a company, there would be a executive function, and that executive function would be deciding how to spend those funds according to some some strategy, some vision, and so forth. Um, through Gitcoin, you've um, uh, and the Gitcoin community has built the quadratic funding mechanism, which which gives us much better understanding of the preferences of the DAO members or the preferences of the community um, about you know what should be funded in their view based on what has been presented to the DAO for funding. Where do you think that this works best, and where or alternatively, where don't you think it's succeeding in in creating the sort of public goods? that we as a, you know, a crypto community really need or as an Ethereum community need? Yeah. One thing I'll just quickly add to what Jason mentioned, which I think is interesting, is because the nature of Gitcoin is like by mission to fund public goods, we end up actually in a scenario in which by funding more public goods, i.e. by running grants rounds, which we do every quarter, we actually end up creating a positive like virtuous cycle at least as far as I can tell, in which spending that treasury ends up getting further treasury funding. So like you could imagine this kind of like net positive effect on like overall treasury size, despite spending treasury funds, that's kind of like this interesting non, you know, investment return on, on capital in the sense that people are simply giving more funding to the treasury so that they can, you know, manage these quadratic funding rounds just so that they can like deploy more to public goods without it being really any kind of, you know, investment or there being any expectation of return. And I think that's a really interesting kind of, uh, you know, point in context of the dichotomy that you mentioned, but in terms of, you know, the ways in which we, we want to see quadratic funding, I think leveraged in the long run in the DAO, like, I think for me, the, the biggest challenge is, is mostly just that you have um, you know limitations on the size and scale of decisions you can make uh, with those sorts of signaling mechanisms at this moment, and partly because you know there's this concept which I'm sure you're both very familiar with of like civil resistance, and ultimately we're still testing the like true robustness of civil resistance in the context of quadratic funding. So on the one hand we've found that um, you know, we're able to scale up to at least three, $4 million in matching funds uh, per quarter, just like not you know, negligible. Um, and we found that we're able to do that in such a way that we're actually able to get a relatively good signal as to like what people care about. Like if you look at the results of the rounds um, for the average Ethereum, like our average participant in the ecosystem, they seem reasonable. They seem like reasonable choices. No one would be like, that's crazy. Why did that get so much money? Um, that happens on occasion, but by and large, the results make sense to people. And so, you know, although we haven't scaled this for the DAO itself, um, the question is still, you know, in the condition of a DAO, to your point, it is more of a club. Are there stronger conditions for civil attacks in that context than there would be in a broader, more disparate community? Um, we haven't gotten to the scale where we can really see that, but I think it's an interesting question that we should be aware of as we start to scale it. There's also the question of, you know, do we at some point implement some idea of like NACI, uh, which is this sort of anti-collusion, um, effectively um, way of hiding the information about a given contributor. Um, and there's trade-offs to that model in which, you know, on the one hand, you get stronger civil resistance, but on the other, you run into this problem in which you don't necessarily have the same social signal from doing your donations, which you might want in order to showcase that you are in fact a productive member of the community. So that's ultimately where we've landed so far, but we're still very much in the process of kind of iterating on these things as we go. And Scott, I, I guess it would be fair to say then the problem with um, uh, a civil attack on a funding regime, you know, an individual pretending or one individual pretending to be more than one individual would be not just 
sort of that it harms the signal from the community, but it could be used for rent seeking effectively. It could be used to distort the spending or what, what are the considerations or what are you most worried about in that sense? I think, yeah, there's definitely a scenario in which, you know, someone tends to gravitate towards solutions that are not really benefiting the community. Like, I mean, this is like the fundamental, any of any, you know, any rent seeking problem is really just what happens when the community starts to, you know, mostly try and vote for things to benefit like a small group that have no real like external, like positive externalities for the broader community. And I, I don't think we've seen that, um, whether that's in the main rounds or whether that's in um, the sort of smaller rounds we've run for the DAO itself. But I think it's uh, it's certainly worth thinking about long term, like what those scenarios might look like. Um, one easy example might be if you look at like what, what might happen if there's only... Uh, you know, three or four grants in a given round, if it's a very small round and there's very few participants, um, you could imagine people naturally gravitating towards uh, the most popular of those individuals. And that's something that's, uh, you know, it's not necessarily rent seeking, but like there's a form of kind of, um, like it's, it's certainly in some form suboptimal, even if that person is providing like significant value, because it means that there's lots of other types of goods that are less popular that might not be as easy to, to, um, to you know, basically like suss out through the process of, of this voting. Um, we've seen some of that, but fortunately it hasn't been, I think, substantial enough to cause like major disruptions in the rounds. Um, but um, it's a good, yeah, it's like, I, I don't think it's the kind of thing that we've like formally mapped out in a way that like um, we, might, we might want to. We kind of do this mapping after each round where we calculate the fraud tax, which tends to be quite low. Um, and we, we calculate basically, um, collusion on that basis, but looking through, um, what types of goods were, you know, potential attacks that didn't occur that, you know, were in the round, but were kind of like those, I don't know, like red herrings that like weren't really impacting the community, um, positively or had no real reason to be, you know, in that round. It's something that the grants review, um, committee is doing, but I don't think we've done a formal analysis of that like scope um, at this point. So Jason, um, one of the research agendas that you've had for a very long time is looking at the ways that we fund innovation. Um, and uh, to, to hark back to my early point, I think it, it strikes me at least that what we're doing in in DAOs and in blockchain communities is that we're we've picked one very particular way of funding innovation or research or development, and that's the grant. But you've looked at other models as well, like, for example, prizes, which we've used, you know, which we're experimenting in the real economy, tenders. Why would you choose grants or prizes or tenders? And maybe if you could sort of take us through the advantages and disadvantages of those alternatives. Yeah. So, this problem of, of how you fund innovation, or how, I mean, is it, it's, it's a search problem. You're trying to solve a, I need to invest some resources into a production process that I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'll, I want an outcome on the other side that is uncertain. So it's an investment under uncertainty problem is, is, is the broad category of it. And that broad category of investment under uncertainty means that there's a number of different mechanisms we can use. Each mechanism trades off on different margins. So um, if we are trying to control fraud, if, if that's the main thing we're concerned about, then we just use administration. We just, we just have a, um, an, a, an administrative hierarchy that will go through a process and there's checklists and so on, and we can minimize fraud. Um, that will just guarantee that we probably learn well, that the investment will um, be okay. But it, there's just there's basically zero chance that we'll, we'll discover something fantastic here. Um, if we know the problem we're trying to solve, like I need um, to have, you know, and there's a very specific you know, engineering sense of what, what a solution looks like such that I can identify it when it's solved. I can describe the problem. I just have no idea what the technology will be to solve that. Prizes, right? So prizes then become the mechanism. And you set the prize exactly proportional to the importance of the solution. If it's a... $10,000 problem, then you, you set a $9,000 prize um, and, and you can guarantee that it'll work. Um, the problem there, though, is is around you have to be able to define, you know, 
def define what the problem is tightly, define what the solution looks like, identify it, and specify when you need the problem solved by. Um, not all problems fit that. And, uh, and, uh, sorry, to, to clarify, like a, a good example of a prize is, you know, get an autonomous vehicle from one to one place to another place, which is easy to measure. We, yeah. we know it when we see it. By Wednesday. And, and, and I need to do it not using, you know, any magical technologies. It's, it's, it has to, you know, so, so prizes sound amazing, except for not all problems are well specified. I don't necessarily know what a solution looks like. Um, and I need to know who's eligible to compete in, in that sort of thing. So the, the great thing about prizes and prizes are often used to solve when I don't know where the solution is going to come from. Um, it might be from my community. It might be from a completely different community altogether. It might be from someone that I don't know and, and can therefore gather together. So, um, you know, we might use a firm to solve it when I know who's going to solve it, the people I just hired. I know how they're going to solve it with the resources that they brought to bear. Um, they just need an incentive, the money I just gave them in the instructions. Um, grants are a different one again. Grants are basically pitch me a good solution. Um, and I, I've got a fixed amount of money. Um, what type of solution can I buy for this money? And, and now that's a different optimization problem because I know how much money I've got. I don't know what problem is going to be solved, um, but I know I'll be able to solve $10,000 worth of problems. Um, so I just have to be really good at choosing the right problem to solve. So gr grants are amazing when you've got amazing prize committees um, that, that, can, that, are, that are good at identifying what they think will be a good set of inputs into a solution. And then you go away and then you, then you will have to monitor. So, um, so then that's the hard yeah, part though, yeah. isn't it? Because, well, no, like, because the, with, the, with the a prize, all it's all ex post. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but a grant has to be almost all ex ante and, and Scott, I'll actually bring you in here as well. And, and thinking about this sort of matrix of sort of when we're looking at, um, when we hand over the funds, um, when we assess whether something's been done, how have you thought at Gitcoin about, well, you know, we, we hand over these funds and that's great, but how do we monitor that what has been done was, was what was proposed or has been done at all? So that's actually with quadratic funding, a huge issue um, to your point. Um, but one beautiful part of quadratic funding is that at least in the way we model it and work with the community on it, it's iterative and it happens every quarter, uh, which means that we have the ability to kind of see after you know quarters uh, passed whether or not someone's actually produced anything based on basically the community coming back and saying, "Hey, you know, did you do the thing?" Now it doesn't really help resolve the original problem of what happens to those funds that were already. Uh, distributed, you know, are those just gone? Is there any recovery mechanism for those? I think ultimately the the goal should be, in my view, that the community over time gets better at, you know, basically learning from those mistakes. Like, so if a community consistently loses like small amounts of capital on, you know, one of 20 grants, they should learn probably like, okay, what was wrong with that grant? Why did we make a mistake with this grant? Let's not give it to those guys we, again. Yeah, yeah. Let's not give it, not to even just that. Like, how can we give, you know, better criteria over time that exclude or or restrict the, or like reduce the probability, therefore, of like those grantees actually getting through to make those mistakes in the first place? And that's something we've started to see happen with the review criteria that we put in place. It's not quite there yet. I think there's a lot of room for improvement. But it's something that we found to be um, improving round over round, which is nice to see. Um, now, the alternative, you know, of I, I definitely think that we have bounties as well, which are actually the first thing that we started with as a as a platform. And and I think the trade offs are if you have to choose between, um, like as you said, like sort of like I guess like ex post ex ante, like I think you're much worse off in the bounty prize sort of scenario because you end up with just like way, um, way more uncertainty around basically whether this thing will ever get uh, solved, like that's proposed basically. Um, because you don't know whether or not anyone who's gonna come out around, you know, with the right set of skills is gonna do it for the price within the time, like to your point, like all those conditions are very much in flux. So when, when given the trade-off, especially like in a very fast moving environment, which like Web3 tends to be, the, the preference, I think, usually should be towards, you know, deploy small amounts of capital iteratively and basically leverage the results of that to deploy further capital, but always be moving forward 
um, you know, versus I think there's lots of projects that actually have these um, RFPs that are relatively substantial that have been, you know, sitting there for months and months and months. And in that time, you know, if they had kind of been more proactive, it could have been something that um, was already solved. So that's um, it. It's, you know, I don't know if I believe that in all. There's like nuance to that, of course, but that's, I think, a really important piece. And Scott, in in that sense, the as as I see it, the the treasury spending problem is really at the absolute heart of if if you view a DAO as a startup in some sense, let's just say a DAO is a company, and the company is a and a DAO is a startup company that needs to compete, and it just needs to get stuff out the door. And I really worry, and I wonder whether you have the same perspective that um, the the grants communities that we have across the space are very focused on protecting small amounts of money from being spent rather than just pushing things out the door. Is that, does that accord with your views or, or, or do you have a different perspective or? Yeah, I definitely think, think that's largely true. I mean, there's the, again, there's nuance to it. The problem is that, you know, it's, it's the amount of capital you're spending relative to the size of the treasury. So, you know, to your point, you don't want to deplete, Spending like you know a quarter of your treasury on something just as a sort of YOLO attempt at seeing whether something works is a terrible idea for like obvious reasons. Um, it's very funny. It could be great. I mean, like there's lots of there's probably a compelling like you know argument for like the meme narrative of doing that it, itself being like I'm sure someone would make the case that like that's enough to justify some crazy expenditure for like you know let's throw like I mean. If you if you think about it, like I mean, a good example would be Pizza Dow. Like Pizza Dow only exists to throw the largest possible pizza party globally, and that is precisely what they spent the funds on. But like that is actually, I mean, one like that's their mandate, and they executed on it. And and two, it's actually something that is you know is a good showcase of like they spent all of their treasury extremely quickly for this particular purpose, and that you know. I, you know, funny enough, not in a dissimilar way to like what we're talking about in the Gitcoin scenario, although like the relative impact, I would say is like different, perhaps like we spent it, you know, um, in these grants rounds in our case for the purpose of, you know, one, creating these positive externalities through the production of these public goods. But in addition, with the expectation that as people see these positive externalities and benefit from them, they will be more inclined to give back. Um, and in part, this happens in um, in Web3 communities because of the fact that we have community currencies and similar to a point that Jason mentioned, when these currencies, you know, when positive externalities are produced, those currencies tend to appreciate, relatively speaking. Like, it's more likely to appreciate the more there is being built, the more public goods there are to actually work. Like, if we didn't have the NFT infrastructure that we have now, we would never have the current, uh, you know, bull market that we, we have. And I think... Um, the that's sort of like an interesting uh, part of this puzzle that I think is, is missing. So yeah, when treasuries say, hey, like, you know, this 20K grant of a, you know, $5 billion treasury, we have to make you go through like, it's, it's kind of the same problem as government grants. Like we want to make you go through like 30 steps to get this grant. Like you're probably not going to, you know, make it as a, as a DAO, I think, relative to others who are more willing to be flexible, which... Incidentally, we, we haven't really talked too much about it is why we tend to focus on like um, work streams or uh, sub DAOs or committees that effectively um, operate independently and have more flexibility in how they spend a smaller portion of, of funds. So like that's a really interesting point, Scott. And I think one of the key ideas that um, that mechanism design or the, um, and a lot of the literature on, on the effectiveness and efficiency of, of various grants mechanisms have emphasized is that what you're wanting to avoid is basically too much optimization because the problem is if I can see clearly how to how the mechanism is being optimized, I can game it. And um, if I know that there's $10,000 up for grabs, I'm rationally going to spend 9999 getting that. And if more than one person makes that decision, we've now got a, a, you know, a wallet auction. We end up losing, we end up having m more effort and resources being put into getting the grant than actually um, is dispersed. And the, the solution to this is just to add some randomization into this. So what this looks like in practice is you 
absolutely minimize the grant applications. Think, you know, two pages, not 10 pages or one page or less. Um, you create a sort of sufficient criteria by, if you meet these basic criteria, you're probably in the running for delivering a solution. Um, a low hurdle to get into the into the round, then we randomize, or we we we, do, we tournament and then randomize. But you, you just you just mix it up a bit because the thing about randomization is it's very cheap, and it's hard to game. And what I've just done is I've basically, um, and it, it also has the un, other other benefit that you know um, grants are basically a search technology. There and, and and they usually work best when they're repeated. So we're dealing with an evolutionary process. Um, we don't want that evolutionary process to channel. We, we want it to be searching the space as widely as possible. Again, randomization is a great way of getting out of channels and just in searching spaces that you might not otherwise look to. So I think that that sort of design principle of um, just trying to minimize the risk of of solving problems that we already, or, or solving the problem that's immediately in front of us, not the problem we actually need to solve. Um, ensuring that we don't end up just giving the same rewards to the same people over and over again, because, um, you know, just for, for risk minimization reasons, is that um, some kind of algorithmic randomization into this process is actually a, a beneficial um, along, you know, for the same reasons that, you know, the quadratic mechanism is amazing for just preference efficiency and, 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 and you know, it, it solves that problem of, of how do we, how do we make them make the most specific preferences. Randomization solves the problem of how do we avoid um, just the whole, the whole grants process eating itself. Which is a perspective that comes from years of bitterness about failed and successful grants and being pretty sure that they're random anyway <laughs> in academia. Um, uh, um, actually, Jason, I'll stick with you because we've been using some really interesting language in this conversation. We've talked about public goods, local public goods, club goods. Club goods, of course, um, refers to a boundary between people who are in and out of the club. Um, Scott's been talking about externalities. Um, quite a bit. What I'm interested in, um, first of all, I'll, I'll ask you, Jason, is um, there isn't just one DAO in the world. There are many, many, many DAOs. And some of the research innovation that we might do in one DAO will have very substantial or or no spillovers to other DAOs that will help the community or be just driven in. When we think about how we're spending treasuries, how much should we be thinking about, is this helping web three generally or crypto generally or should we be just trying to um go for monopolistic benefits that just drive our competitive advantage forward or you know what is there a philosophy there or or how do you think about the world of DAOs in this grant context yeah so we started this conversation by recognizing that treasuries and grant applicant and grants are solving a problem of local public goods public goods problem for our community. Um, a, a club is just a, a, a mechanism for individuals to, to put, push positive externalities onto other people, right? So that's that's what that solves. Um, the problem you just described is just, now we nest that into, into a hierarchy. There's just, um, a, there's a, an individual DAO can produce um, resource a, a resource for its community, but that, commun that resource for that community can itself have spillover externality benefits on other communities. So what is that? That's just the same problem repeated at a higher level. Um, so this notion of, of nested public goods um, is, is, is really what we're talking about here. And you know, fortunately, the solution is exactly the same. We just need to build um, grants of grants, DAOs of DAOs, um, you know, public goods of public goods. And what that would look like is, is just a coordination mechanism that enables each individual grants program or treasury to create a higher order treasury or grants program um, to solve that same problem. Now, it may well be that the, the mechanisms that work at one level are different at the other one. So maybe grants here, prizes there, and taxes above that, um, or, 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 or vice versa, just you know, different mechanisms for different purposes, because as we've been discussing, um, you know, there's no there's no perfect solution. Every 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 mechanism trades off against different other things in different ways and optimizes in different ways, and that's why they're hard to sort of figure out exactly what is the correct one to use. But the general philosophy here is it's it's the same problem just repeated at a higher level. Um, it's self similar. Scott, I mean, you're you're sort of the perfect person to talk to about this because Gitcoin has a a, a mission to um, support the Ethereum ecosystem, not just to support the Gitcoin DAO. But how do you think about the the those externalities, your responsibility, and then how should um, 
uh, a- any other DAO, like Pizza DAO, think about their responsibilities? So firstly, I think it's very interesting that we're talking about externalities um, because often, you know, people talk about public goods as, you know, non-excludable, non-rivalrous, and it's a very um, uh, restrictive definition, I think, relative to like thinking just about in terms of like, you know, what is the um, amount that the market is failing this particular good? And then what is the amount of positive externality that this good produces? And so, yeah, the idea that like, you know, something that's effectively a club can produce something that is like um, a public good is like kind of obvious in that framing, but is less obvious in the context of like the non-excludable, non-rivalrous framing, which I think we're like very used to in a lot of like traditional thinking like um, of public goods. But in terms of, you know, our mission, like we tend to think about the Ethereum ecosystem as the starting point for, and in some, in some ways the shelling point for solving coordination problems in a global sense. And so although we're building things for Ethereum, we hope that in this same sort of nested sense, Ethereum is then solving problems on a global scale for other things. So, I mean, a good example of this might be the work that folks like uh, Toucan or Klimadao are doing with respect to climate change. So, you know, how do we solve the problem of people being very unwilling to put money forward for things that are effectively, uh, you know, um, good for the environment. Um, often the challenge is to get people to actually spend money on um, their own capital on, you know, things like carbon credits to push forward these, these, you know, these solutions. So um, their solution is basically let's create effectively a, a sort of like DeFi game in which you're basically like buying up these, these bonds, which happen to be um, tied into, um, you know, carbon credits and tied into carbon markets. And it works because like precisely like this sort of like selfish DeFi economics, like people are drawn to that sort of mentality and drawn to those sorts of um, those sorts of games. And, you know, it happens to produce a positive outcome uh, and positive externalities. Um, and that's one example of where I think Ethereum is there by creating positive externalities that would not otherwise exist, um, you know, in the, the sort of like broader world, not that, you know, governments and companies aren't trying to solve this broader problem of climate change, but they've generally been not doing a very good job. <laughs> like, I don't know if you like kind of look at the broader system we're in right now, like there's lots of, just look at like the world, like there's, there's clearly a lot to be, yeah, to be done there. And I think um, this is not like, you know, I'm not saying that like clean is going to like save the entire world, like that would be kind of absurd, but I think it's certainly a step in the right direction and it provides those tools in a way that, you know, is clearly benefiting more people than just Ethereum sort of like stakeholders. Um, And I think that's exactly the kind of like, you know, thing we're talking about when we're talking about these nested hierarchies of uh, positive externalities. Is it necessary, Scott, then to um, have everybody who's participating in Gitcoin to sort of be signed up to the Gitcoin mission or message. The reason I ask is because I, I think when we're thinking about this, um, the DAO ecosystem, well, the individual contributors to the DAO might have loyalties to multiple DAOs at the same time, right? So you might hold Ethereum, you might also hold Bitcoin, you might also hold Zcash, you might also hold a, a, any number of particular, you know, DApps or DAOs or Layer Twos or all, all these sorts of things. Um, is there a role for Gitcoin, the organization, to sort of be teaching people about the sort of stuff that they want to see and to sign them up to the mission, or or, or are you just watching it evolve and see what the community decides? I definitely think we have a responsibility uh, to get people to understand what public goods are and why they matter. Um, if only because, you know, there's still a portion of people, even when you look at games like Klimadao, you know, who won't participate, um, perhaps even like in some form, uh, you know, maybe even maliciously if they're like, well, you know, I'd rather try and figure it like they don't have, they have zero interest in um, the positive, you know, a gain that this could provide to a broader group. They're just like, okay, I could choose between this return or this return, and they're going to choose something that maybe is like a slightly higher return than Klima Dao on a given day if for some reason the returns change. Like that sort of thing, um, 
you know, I think it can be um, at least one step, like trying to get people to understand the difference there and why it might make sense to try and like, you know, still participate in a system that has slightly more positive externalities. Um, that understanding is still, you know, incrementally better than not having it. And I think, you know, in terms of DAO participants, especially, um, we mostly want people who are involved in the Gitcoin community to be there for the right reasons, um, i.e. like to understand the mission, understand why they're there. Partly because um, there is this problem across very large communities um, in which there is a token involved where you, gr you, you, you do get a lot of noise. And I think that, you know, um, for us, like, like that noise is, I think, you know, generally detrimental to the mission at large. Um, I think there's a lot of projects that don't quite recognize that problem and are willing to, uh, you know, kind of forego addressing it. And I think that is a long run uh, mistake because you're, you know, in many ways, your community is only as strong as like the, uh, the, the sort of like, um, weakest group. And I don't mean that in like sort of a, um, I, I mean that only in the sense that like you need people to be driving all in the same direction. And if you're getting pulled back by a given group, um, it can really be, be harmful. A good example of where this happened, um, perhaps not around public goods, but in terms of philosophy was with sushi, right? So sushi had the core team. They wanted to pursue a direction that would actually net net help basically the sushi community, in my opinion, uh, push forward its, its narrative and its, its, its goals. Um, but because there was this noise in the background, it, it was very hard for them to actually like execute on that and to, to make it happen. So, you know, part of that is just a lack of understanding of mission and, and lack of mission alignment that comes with that additional noise. Um, in our case, yeah, like therefore, you know, educating people about public goods is just like ultimately like, like, you know, we think it's important for the community at large, for Ethereum at large, for Web3 at large, but it's uh, perhaps even more important for the Gitcoin community itself. In that sense, Jason, there's um, almost a DAO cultural politics that has to be at the foundation of these um, uh, b before we can decide how we're going to spend this treasury. Yeah, I mean, these are collective action problems. They're inherently political. That's a thing that, you know, I mean, if we didn't know that before, we're, we're clearly learning that now. I mean, I think that there's a few interesting differences, though. So, um, you know, compared to, say, um, Republican or Democratic politics, in a, um, you know, I mean that in the, in the broader sense, not the American party sense, but um, that the way DAO problems are solved is sort of issue by issue. You you, you raise a proposal for this, um, or, or we or have a grant for this, and, and you take it in individual issue. So it's a very entrepreneurial, market driven solution that that nevertheless has a collective action funding mechanism wrapped around it. Sort of entrepreneurial proposing of a problem or a solution, and then the funding model. Um, just it's just worth pausing to reflect that that's not how politics and nation states work, where you have a ticket, where you have a, just a list of, these are all the things we're going to do with the money, with the, with the collective money. And that's a sort of series of negotiations that um, you, know, you might say, oh, I like that, but, but not that, but whatever. But you have to vote for the whole ticket or the other one. So you end up with um, these sort of very politically negotiated um, issues that, you know, Basically, it's hard to be engaged about all of them because you know, um, amongst that, there might be an issue that you care about, but you, get, you, have to, you have to buy the whole package. So that, that sort of, I think, you know, we're at a sort of different point with um, the way in which DAO politics are working is that it's very much entrepreneurial, single issue politics, um, which has enormous benefits. It can be fast, it can be focused, it can really get into things and solve those problems. But the one thing it doesn't do very well is deal with large coordinated joined up things that you need you know, a high level sort of political visionary that, that, that can see that there's actually 27 things that all need to happen. Um, and each constituency will only care about some of them, but the whole thing needs to happen. So that kind of, I mean, I think this is a question that um, Chris and myself have been discussing about whether, whether sort of um, political parties or protocol politicians are this kind of the next step in Dow governance evolution, whether, you know, whether that would be an amazing thing to help move everything forward or just a, a or exactly what we're trying to get away from backwards <laughs> into, into uh, the worst aspects of the 20th century um, i genuinely don't what, know what the answer is 
What I like about this conversation is that we started with how can you construct the technicalities of a grants program and organize the agreement and we've ended up with sort of culture and voting. So I'm going to give the last question to you, Scott. So how do we set that culture? So if culture and if the um, a sign up to the mission of the DAO is what's going to drive the grants programs and drive how we spend, what, what do we need to do? Do we need to have like the DAO version of corporate anthems? Do we do we need constitutions? Do we need flags? What 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 do you how 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 can you convince the the members of Gitcoin to sign up to the Gitcoin um, uh, agenda or story or mission? We clearly need just uh, very uh, flashy political ads. It's uh, <laughs> be, uh, but I, I think that the issue right now is that if we look at um, yeah, if we look at culture across Web three, it I, I don't think we've actually done a very good job of articulating our values as an ecosystem, um, even beyond individual DAOs. Um, and I actually suspect that this is that's one of the broader problems that. Um, we need to be solving before we can actually like solve for this, um, you know, more, more, more broadly and, and like propagate this message out to the rest of the world. You're kind of seeing this with like, even like not to get too um, far off track, but with the meta conversations and with Facebook entering web three or with, you know, projects like world coin, for example, which I, I think probably take us somewhat in, what I would argue just from a personal perspective, like the wrong direction. Um, and I think they take us in the wrong direction um, without really, um, you know, there's, there's almost concentric circles of, I think most people would agree that, you know, Facebook entering the space in this way is like kind of disingenuous and perhaps not like the direction you want to take. There's probably a smaller percentage of people that would agree that, you know, any given arbitrary DeFi protocol is like not living up to XYZ standard of decentralization. And it's not that we all have to agree on those things, but I think we need to definitely set some rough sort of values for the ecosystem, especially as like the scope of what this ecosystem touches grows. And I think that's one of the mistakes that Web1 made was not doing that. And which is how we ended up the, you know, last vestige of the semantic web kind of being the Facebook like in the Web2 era. And I think, you know, perhaps we can start by, yeah, defining our own constitutions in the context of DAOs. Um, it's something we've uh, been doing internally in the DAO and Gitcoin. It's something that ENS actually has explicitly done at its inception, uh, requiring everyone to uh, sign on to a set constitution, um, which I thought was an amazing idea. And that sort of thinking, if we can kind of combine, um, you know, and sort of like um, triangulate all these different constitutions that DAOs come up with, I think we can get to a set of principles that, yeah, will help us push this forward um, and help us all align on the idea, you know, first and foremost, that, uh, you know, public goods are good, that like this is something that we should care about because there's still certainly a lot of folks in sort of the Bitcoin arena, you know, going back to even like 2012, 2013, that don't really think there's any world or, or role for public goods um, at all, not to say that's true of everyone who's in that space. And I think that, um, you know, that's one part of it is just getting alignment on things like that, but getting uh, more nuanced alignment on, you know, what decentralization means, uh, what kinds of, you know, um, protocols we think, uh, you know, are or aren't in scope for what we want to see in the Ethereum ecosystem or what we want to give, you know, credibility to in the Ethereum ecosystem. This was just a big debate with FWB as well in terms of the membership cost for being in the DAO, which I personally think you know, the folks running after BP are doing a really good job overall, but there's certainly a question of like, yeah, how exclusive versus inclusive do we want to be? Um, and then as we go further, there's more and more questions like that, that, you know, will naturally arise and having the skills to address them from these previous, you know, triangulations of these constitutions and previous discussions around these values will only make that easier. And through that process, um, it almost becomes obvious, I think, what we should be spending our treasuries on. So um, it's kind of a abstract answer, maybe, but hopefully that helps. Uh, I'm I'm an academic economist. I love abstract answers. Um, Scott, that was awesome. Jason, a fantastic conversation. I'd like to thank you both for joining me. 
Thank you so much.